Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at a column from page number 6 of the Delhi edition. In this column, the writers make a strong case for implementing environmental fiscal reforms in India for financing the country's healthcare sector. See the pandemic has exposed the critical gaps in our healthcare sector thereby necessitating a higher funding for the healthcare sector. As the healthcare needs of the country increases, the government would be expected to step up public spending on healthcare. But the government finances are already under severe stress and the government is staring at a fiscal deficit of 9.5% of the GDP for the financial year 2020-21. This strain on government finances has been a direct result of the stimulus package that the government had to announce as a result of the pandemic and the lockdowns. and even as government expenses have gone up its tax revenue has declined due to the slowdown in the economic activities as a result of the lockdown restrictions so the combination of increased expenditure and declining revenue has affected the finances of the government thereby increasing the fiscal deficit and under such circumstances it might be difficult for the government to increase public spending on healthcare it is in this context that the writers propose the implementation of a series of environmental fiscal reforms including the possible implementation of an environment tax or an eco tax which could help in increasing government revenue and these additional resources that would be generated could be used by the government to finance the needs of the healthcare sector then along with that environmental taxes and environmental fiscal reforms also brings in the added benefit of reducing pollution and as well as in tackling the impact of climate change to highlight the importance of public spending on healthcare the writers refer to data provided by the who which indicates that in most countries around the world out of pocket healthcare expenditure is very high and in the case of india 17.33% of the country's population is spending more than 10% of their total income while the global average that is spending more than 10% on healthcare stands at 12.67% india's rural areas consist of a higher percentage of the population that is spending more than 10% of their total income on healthcare similarly 3.9% of the country's population is spending more than 25% of their total income on healthcare and for the rural areas this number stands at 4.34% so the burden of financing their own healthcare is having a detrimental impact on the financial and social status of the citizens and in a situation where out of pocket expenditure is very high it is very essential for the government to step in and increase public spending on healthcare in fact even the economic survey makes a similar argument and calls upon the government to increase public spending on healthcare from the current 1% of the country's gdp to at least 2.5 to 3% of the gdp as outlined under the national health policy of 2017 but for increasing public spending on healthcare the government might find it difficult to raise finances considering that the pandemic has already strained its fiscal position so in such a scenario it's unlikely for the government to increase its spending on healthcare and hence the writers come out with a innovative solution to suggest a new route of funding for the healthcare sector by levying environmental tax through environmental fiscal reforms because the pandemic has shown us that climate change and environmental degradation have an inevitable impact on healthcare and it is only justified to raise additional resources that is financial resources for the healthcare sector by taxing those economic activities which are responsible for degrading the environment and by levying such a environmental tax we can even expedite climate action efforts in order to mitigate the impact of climate change inducing economic activities however the writers also caution that the success of such an environmental tax would be dependent on its architecture that is how would such a tax structure be designed and how would it be implemented if such a environmental tax is well designed based on a solid plan and if the taxation mechanism is designed to be credible transparent and predictable then definitely such an environmental tax can introduce environmental fiscal reforms thereby raising fresh resources for the government which can be channeled towards the healthcare sector the writers recommend 
that such an environmental tax, if it is imposed, it should be kept equal to the marginal social cost of the environmental damage that is caused by growth and economic activities. See, economic growth and environment conservation are conflicting objectives. Promotion of growth and economic activities always comes at the cost of the environment as any activity of production, consumption, manufacturing, disposal and trade of goods and services does cause damage to the environment. This environmental damage caused by economic activities can be scientifically assessed through environmental impact assessment and there are scientific methods through which the social cost of this damage can be estimated. So the writers suggest that through such an assessment, the government can scientifically determine the marginal social cost of environmental damage and on par with that, the environmental tax structure can be designed so that these taxes and fiscal reforms can not only help in curbing pollution and dealing with climate change, but it can also bring in fresh revenue to the government which can be channeled towards the healthcare sector. The writer says that through such environmental tax reforms, the government can decide whether the additional revenue would be used to fulfill certain basic public goods or to finance the healthcare sector. But considering the pandemic and considering the higher out-of-pocket expenditure, it is high time for the government to make use of any such additional revenue to fund the healthcare sector in order to take up public spending on healthcare to 2.5 to 3% of the GDP as it has been envisioned under the national health policy. According to the writers, such an environmental fiscal reform can be implemented through various steps. For example, the government can figure out the subsidies and the taxes that currently exist which are aiding environmental damage and destruction. For example, the subsidies being provided to vehicles and industries which are inefficient in fuel consumption. Such environment damaging subsidies and taxes can be abolished. Then, the government can restructure the existing taxes in order to incentivize environment friendly activities and increase the cost on environment damaging activities. Then apart from these changes to the existing tax structure, the government can even consider the introduction of an entirely new environmental tax and on sectors such as transportation, waste generation, energy production and transmission, etc. Differential taxation could be imposed based on the extent to which these industries are damaging the environment. Through such steps, the government can provide for efficient environmental fiscal reforms and these environmental taxes could even be integrated with the architecture of the GST. But see, the critics of environmental taxation have always argued that such environmental regulation and such environmental taxes will affect growth negatively and it could compromise the socio-economic agenda of the country. But according to the writers, this argument doesn't hold good even though it's a valid concern because the European experience with environmental taxation shows that such environmental taxes and fiscal reforms doesn't necessarily have a negative impact on growth. In fact, in many cases, environmental fiscal reforms have actually triggered new types of economic activities and has contributed to more income and job creation in few European countries. While a poorly designed environmental regulation and taxation system might affect growth, this concern can be addressed and resolved with a well-designed and well-implemented tax architecture. Now let's take up another column from page number 6. This column deals with the rise in black marketeering during the pandemic. During last year's first wave and during the current deadly second wave, COVID-19 patients and their relatives around the country have faced a severe shortage of essential drugs, medicines and interventions. Massive shortages have been reported of essential drugs including antivirals such as Remdesivir, Tocilizumab and the others as doctors continue to prescribe them despite their limited efficacy and despite the WHO coming out with guidelines against their usage. But friends and relatives of patients who are desperate to save their loved ones get ready to try anything or procure anything that is needed to save them and the critical shortage of these drugs has resulted in a thriving black market where a few middlemen have managed to hoard these drugs and in a shocking and inhuman manner, several people have resorted to profiteering during a time of grave humanitarian crisis that the country has been dealing with. Similarly, 
severe shortages have been reported with regard to availability of hospital beds especially icu facilities with ventilator support and during the peak of the second wave critical shortages were reported with regard to oxygen supplies across hospitals and in several unfortunate incidents around the country many patients even lost their lives due to shortage or non availability of oxygen in these testing times the urgent requirement of these essential items led to their massive shortage considering the wave of cases that india was dealing with but parallelly a black market started to thrive and in a desperate attempt to save their loved ones their attendants have ended up shelling thousands of rupees for these essential items thus perpetuating one of the gravest crises that india has ever dealt with according to the writers such holding and illegal stockpiling of essential drugs and medicines has been made possible because of the critical inadequacy of resources and the shortage of these items which our governments have failed to address in a timely manner the severe crisis created by the shortage created a fertile ground for a black market to flourish and these middlemen and agents they not only sold genuine drugs and medicines that they had hoarded at exorbitant prices but in many instances they have even sold fake drugs and fake medicines by extorting thousands of rupees from vulnerable people to address this shortage and to streamline the availability of these items the state governments and the local governments they did set up dedicated helplines but the unresponsiveness of these helplines and their inability to provide timely help and assistance pushed people around the country into the hands of these black marketeers now the blame for this crisis solely lies with our governments all the tiers of the government that is the center the states and the local governments have effectively failed to arrest holding and black marketeering and the responsibility for this failure solely lies at their doorsteps because when it comes to such essential medicines drugs and medical interventions including hospital beds and oxygen supplies the center and the states both have a equal responsibility considering the scale of the disaster that we are dealing with the center is largely responsible for procuring and allocating these precious resources to states whereas the state governments and the local governments are responsible for its distribution to ensure that these supplies reaches the right places at the right time but for several weeks in the last two months there has been complete chaos in the supply of these items and their critical inadequacy and shortages have pushed the people to reach out to the black market and pay any price that has been quoted in the desperate need to save their loved ones so according to the writers this failure of the administrative machinery can be fixed only by further expanding the administrative machinery the center states and the local governments will have to work more proactively and effectively to fix the problems in procurement and allocation and address the shortcomings in distribution and logistics and to achieve this the administrative machinery at all the three levels of the government will have to be expanded and strengthened then at the same time it is very important for the governments to recognize the role being played by volunteer organizations and ngos and it is high time for the governments to tie up with these institutions and support their efforts in addressing these critical challenges because these organizations have done a phenomenal job around the country and it is time for the government to go back and learn lessons from india's several socio economic welfare programs many of which were successfully implemented in active collaboration with ngos and volunteer organizations this model of governments collaborating with ngos and volunteer organizations can go a long way in making the system more responsive and in fixing the shortages and there is also a need for our governments especially the central and the state governments to improve their communication and they need to put in place efficient logistics because it was the failure to address these challenges which led to the shortages of these essentials take for example how sufficient oxygen was available in certain parts of the country but the governments were unable to move them to the right places at the right time due to inefficient logistics then along with that many scams have been reported around the country with regard to hospital bed allocation and as well as with regard to the allocation and distribution of these essential drugs and medicines and hence both the center and the states will have to take the responsibility to provide for more transparent allocation without any favoritism 
and the states through the local governments will have to ensure timely and effective distribution. Then to tackle black marketing and to punish the black marketeers, we currently have sufficient legal provisions, but what we need is strict enforcement so that the guilty could be punished. So for this, there is a need for an independent vigilance system that can be set up by the government, which can proactively tackle the menace of holding and black marketeering at the local level. And these measures should go a long way in addressing these critical shortages. Now let's take up an article from page number four that deals with the National Socialist Council of Nagaland or the NSCN and its various factions. See, the NSCN is one of the most prominent of all the Northeast insurgent outfits and it was established in 1980 to lead the Naga insurgency. See, the Naga insurgency dates back to India's days of independence and back then the Naga insurgency was being led by the Naga National Council. Following the weakening of this organization in 1975, few members of the Naga National Council, they agreed to sign the Shillong Accord with the government of India as a peace accord in order to bring Naga insurgency to an end. But this accord was not acceptable to few extremist leaders of the NNC and they not only boycotted the Shillong Accord, but they even went on to establish one of the most deadliest insurgent outfits of the region, that is the NSCN. It stands for the National Socialist Council of Nagaland. The main objective of Naga insurgency and the NSCN has been to establish Greater Nagaland or the so-called Greater Nagaland as an independent nation. Their objective has been to unite all the Naga inhabited areas in the northeast of India and as well as in neighboring Myanmar and by bringing these Naga inhabited areas in Assam, Manipur, Nagaland, Myanmar and Arunachal Pradesh. Their ambition was to liberate this region from India and Myanmar and establish this region as a separate nation for the Nagas known as the Greater Nagaland. After several years of insurgency, this outfit split into multiple factions in 1988 and due to ideological differences between the leaders, Isaac and Muiva went on to set up the NSCN IM, whereas SS Kaplang went on to establish the NSCN Kaplang faction. These two outfits continued their insurgency against the government of India by using safe havens located in Myanmar and at times they even sought safe sanctuaries in neighboring Bangladesh. Then eventually, after decades of insurgency, the NSCN agreed for a ceasefire agreement with the government of India in 1997 and after the NSCN IM faction signed the ceasefire agreement, a few years later, the NSCN Kaplang faction as well as agreed to the ceasefire agreement. But within a short span of time, both the outfits, they did not respect the ceasefire and they violated the provisions and they continued their insurgent war. After several years of efforts by India and after effective counter-insurgency operations and with the support of the friendly Sheikh Hasina government in Bangladesh, India finally managed to weaken the NSCN IM faction and this insurgent outfit agreed for talks and negotiations with the government of India and as a result in 2015, the historic Naga Framework Agreement was signed in the presence of the Prime Minister. This framework agreement has laid the foundation for the negotiation of a peace accord to bring Naga insurgency to an end. So to take forward these negotiations for a peace accord under the framework agreement, the government of India has appointed a special envoy, that is R.N. Ravi, who is currently the governor of Nagaland, and he has been holding talks with various Naga insurgent groups and political groups. The key demand of the Nagas currently is for a separate flag for the Naga areas and for a separate constitution with several special provisions in order to protect the rights of the Nagas. In return, they are ready to remain within the Indian Union under the terms of the Indian constitution. But the demand for a separate flag and a constitution is not acceptable to the government of India and as a result, the talks have been delayed. But in the meanwhile, the other faction of NSCN, that is the Kaplang faction, rejected this framework agreement that was signed in 2015 and it declared to continue its war against India and immediately shifted its base permanently to Myanmar. So by using Myanmar as a base, the NSCN Kaplang faction has been carrying out many attacks against India including a deadly attack against the Indian Army in Manipur in 2015 
as a retaliation against the signing of this agreement. Following this attack by the Kaplang faction, the Indian army retaliated by carrying out surgical strikes across the border inside Myanmar. And few years later, with the support of Myanmar, India even conducted Operation Sunrise as a joint operation to target the Northeast insurgent groups that were finding a safe haven in Myanmar, especially the NSE and Kaplang faction. Apart from these two main factions, there are several more minor factions that were there, including the NSCN Kole Kitovi faction, the NSCN Unification faction, and the NSCN Reformation faction. While all these were minor factions, recently a new faction of the Kaplang group has been born, known as the NSCN Kaplang YA. YA stands for Yung Ong, who currently heads this outfit, and he is none other than the nephew of SS Kaplang. Following the death of Kaplang in 2017, his nephew broke away from the Kaplang faction and he is leading a separate organization today in these areas. Currently, these outfits, including the NSE and IM, they dominate some of these areas where they extort money from the local people in order to finance their operations. The local shops, businessmen and all the enterprises, they are ordered by these outfits to pay a monthly ransom or else they will face action from these groups. And it is through such extortion and blackmailing that these groups have been financing themselves. Since several years, the NSC and IM faction has largely controlled these areas of Arunachal Pradesh over here, along with few other parts of Naga inhabited areas in Assam and Nagaland. Whereas the Kaplang faction has largely restricted itself to Nagaland and few neighboring areas in Myanmar, including the Sagaing division, where several Naga tribes can be found. So through such territorial division, they have divided their extortion business as well. But even though these groups shared intense rivalry against each other, it has been recently reported that they are attempting a peace agreement amongst themselves in order to unite and come back together to continue the insurgent war against India. Because currently, NSE and IM is unhappy with the peace talks that are going on as India has denied the possibility of providing a separate flag and a separate constitution to the Naga areas. Next, on page number 5, we have a small article that makes a reference to the India Biodiversity Award. See, this award was instituted in 2012 by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change of the Government of India in association with the UN Development Programme, which operates a separate branch out of India. This award was instituted to recognize and honor any outstanding achievements with regard to biodiversity conservation and governance that is focused on the sustainable usage of our biodiversity resources, particularly at the grassroots level. This award was launched by India in association with UNDP when India was hosting the Conference of Parties or the COP to the Convention on Biological Diversity. See, the CBD Convention is one of the most important environment-related conventions that was born along with the Climate Change Convention during the Rio Earth Summit of 1992. This convention is focused on three primary goals. One is the conservation of biological diversity. Two, the sustainable usage of the components of biodiversity. And three, ensuring the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits that arise out of the utilization of genetic resources. This convention is critical for biodiversity conservation and protection around the world. And till date, 196 nations have ratified it, including India. As a part of these commitments, India enacted the Biodiversity Act of 2002 under which the National Biodiversity Authority of India has been set up. This institution plays a key role in the award selection process, which is announced every year on the 22nd of May to mark the International Day for Biological Diversity. The award basically recognizes the work of local governments, local communities, and as well as NGOs and government leaders with regard to their contribution towards biodiversity conservation. Four specific areas have been identified for the award selection process, and this includes conservation of wild and domesticated species, sustainable use of biological resources, replicable mechanisms for access and benefit sharing, and best biodiversity management committees. As you can see, all the award categories are in line with the objectives of the CBD convention. Next, on page number 11, we have an article that makes a reference 
to the 17 plus 1 initiative. According to the article, Lithuania has expressed interest to quit the 17 plus 1 initiative. So let's understand what is this 17 plus 1 initiative. See, this is essentially a diplomatic initiative of China and the plus 1 over here refers to China. It is a China-led diplomatic format which was launched in 2012 to promote China's connectivity and economic interaction with the Central European and Eastern European countries. Under this initiative, there are 17 European nations which take part that includes 12 European member states and 5 Balkan states. Please look at the map. These are the countries of Central Europe and Eastern Europe that are interacting with China under the 17 plus 1 format. There are 12 European Union members and 5 of them are non-European members. Ever since China launched its Belt and Road Initiative, it has been giving exclusive focus and attention to Central Europe and Eastern Europe because this is one area where Chinese investments were found to be lacking. Because compared to Central and Eastern Europe, China has very strong trading relations with West European states. In West Europe, it's largely developed nations which are present. And as these countries usually side with US on certain strategic matters, China was running into several issues with West European nations. So to counterbalance the developed West European countries within the European region, China opened a new initiative to connect with the Central and East European countries which are less developed and which are more backward as compared to West European countries. And that is how the 17 plus 1 initiative was born. Through this initiative, China has promoted its trade relationship with these countries. And by keeping the Belt and Road Initiative in focus, China is proactively looking to develop several critical infrastructure projects in this region, including the construction of bridges, roadways, railway lines, etc. China is also interested in investing in the modernization of key trading ports in the Central and Eastern European region. But off late, some of these countries, which are part of 17 plus 1 initiative, they have started expressing concerns about China's intentions because many of these countries have started registering a huge trade deficit against China. Some of these countries are also concerned about the security implications of engaging with China. And based on these concerns, Lithuania has decided to quit the 17 plus 1 initiative. Now let's look at the main practice questions. The first question, the pandemic has led to a surge in black marketeering of essential drugs and medicines, suggest measures to dismantle these networks. The second question, environmental fiscal reforms will reduce pollution and generate resources for financing the healthcare sector. In the light of the statement, evaluate the viability of an environmental tax in India. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for today. Thanks for watching.